All right. Testing. Let's get this mic going. Now you can hear me. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the final round of POW Pitch of the Week. Woohoo! Round of applause for our winning teams joining us for the finals. Thank you, judges. And uh, if you don't know what's going on or what this is, please feel free to come and take a, a seat in one of these fancy yellow chairs or on the blue couch or anywhere you feel comfortable. Uh, so our three winning teams, I'm going to just go ahead and announce your, the names of our teams uh, right away, and then we'll do introductions in a little bit. The Almost Invisible Cows, this is our team one. Team two, the Psycho Llamas. Think Psycho Dramas. And team three, the Beardy McBeardo Faces. So excited to have you guys back. And I'm excited about the magic that you're about to create. All right, so for those of you who don't know, and to remind our teams, the teams will be given a random prompt and 20 minutes to devise a pitch based on the prompt. It can be an idea for an invention, a product or service, a solution to a pressing problem, or anything else that speaks to the prompt. This is where I like to say you can get weird with it if you want. It doesn't need to be feasible or practical as long as you stick to the prompt. It doesn't matter how risky, ridiculous, fictional, or imaginary you get. Or practical, whatever. Whatever speaks to you. Teams will be judged on their teamwork, communication, and creative thinking. You can use the internet to help you brainstorm, and then you can deliver your, pit, your pitch using PowerPoint, or Google Slides, or Prezi, or nothing. However you decide you and your team want to pitch your pitch. All right, now, this is the whiteboard of information. Our, hash, our Twitter handle, handle or hashtag? God, I'm old. Hashtag POWUTA, if you're, if you're watching and you want to tweet about it, use the hashtag POWUTA, our live feed. We're live on Facebook, you guys. Hey, Facebook! It's facebook.com forward slash UTA libraries. We're also going to have live voting for those of you watching here or in the internet land. Pollev.com forward slash Martin Wallace, no E at the end of that. 439, P O L L E V dot com forward slash M A R T I N W A L L A C 439. And once we get to voting, we'll be showing the live voting right here. We'll also have an archive of the videos of the last three weeks and today on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash user forward slash QTA library. Fun. You can go watch your winning moments and whoever's going to be the winner today. What'd you say? Yeah, show your parents and grandparents and, I don't know, potential love interests, who knows? Okay, now we're gonna create our prompt. Each one of you has a deck of cards on your table. Pick a card from the deck, one card. You can pick off the top, middle, bottom, doesn't matter. Right now, pick the card that you're going to use and that will make up our prompt. Everybody ready? So within this prompt, there's going to be a discipline, an equipment, and a material. What do you guys have? Our discipline is engineering. Lovely. <laughs> he said, all right, boys and girls, you're getting ready. What do you guys have? Equipment is battery. All right, all right. How much more generic can you get? Let's see what our material is. All right, moldable plastics. Moldable plastics. All right, discipline, engineering, equipment, battery, material, moldable plastics. There's lots that can happen with this. Martin is setting up the 20 minute timer. And once that starts, you guys can't get started quite yet. Thank you. Oh yes. 20 minutes and go. You guys know the drill, so get cooking. And while they start, I'm gonna introduce everybody on the teams and provide you with some fun random trivia from the internet. 
Our team won the Almost Invisible Cows is Su Hyun Lee, a sophomore nursing major who minors in leadership. Reese Walker is a senior public relations major who minors in advertising. I almost said Walker, because that's how he said earlier he wanted his name pronounced. Whatever. And Cyril Luterat is a senior computer science and engineering major. The almost invisible cows. Give them another round of applause while they're doing their thanking. So in previous weeks, I had random trivia that had to do with the team names. So I had some invisible cow and random general cow trivia. And now it's just going to be random trivia since I already exhausted what was out there for the name. <laughs> There's actually a fun website that's called Random Trivia Generator. Dot net or com, I don't know, but every time you refresh, it's a new page of random pretty cool trivia. So the first trivia question, and this is for the audience, I've got candy to throw at you if you're correct. Even if you're not correct, I'm happy to throw candy at you if you try. The first trivia question is, does anyone know what is a group of sparrows called? Does anyone know what a group of sparrows is called? Feel free to give it a guess. Anyone? Does anyone know what a group of sparrows is called? You want to try to guess? No? Flying rats. Flying rats. Flock, no. What'd you say? Did you? Oh, no, that's okay. I didn't know this, but it's called a host. A host of sparrows. Isn't that lovely? Just a host of them. I saw a sparrow yesterday morning in my backyard. I said, hello, sparrow, where's your host? I didn't say that. But I'm your host for this. I don't think, did I say my name earlier? I'm Tessa White. I work here at the libraries as the service desk manager. In case you wondered who this crazy lady is shouting random trivia. All right, next question. This is maybe easier. How many players are there in a standard polo team? Standard polo team, how many players? Does somebody shout out back here? Anybody know? This one is probably easier to try and guess because you know it's going to be a number. Nope, but I'll give you some, I'll give you some candy. How many players are there in a standard polo team? Nope, but I'll give you candy too. It's much lower than you would think. You got it, sir. Did you know that or did you just guess? Good guess. Oh, yay, Martin. Thank you. We got the correct answer back here. Previous team member. It was four. Four players in a standard polo team. All right, next trivia question. What breed of dog is Snoopy? Well, yes, you're correct. Our judge here got it correct. Snoopy is a beagle. Yeah. What is that, the cabbage patch? <laughs> Did you just do the cabbage patch? I think I saw that. Very, very nice. Talk about throwback. All right, that is correct. I, I, you wouldn't guess beagle, really, because he doesn't quite look like one in the cartoon, but... That's the right answer. All right, last random trivia question for this moment. What two countries share land borders with Tunisia? It's a little tricky. What two countries share land borders with Tunisia? You're right on one of them. Anyone want to guess? Martin guessed one of the correct answers. Nobody else feeling courageous? Well, yes, you're right. I mean, you got one of the answers correct. The question is, what two countries share land borders with Tunisia? Yes, sir. Would you like some candy? The correct answer, which this gentleman back here just provided, is Algeria and Libya. Thank you. So just so you know, if you're back here studying and you hear questions, you want to shout it out, do it. There's candy involved. 
All right, team two, the Psycho Llamas. Hi, guys. How's the thinking going? I don't want to interrupt too much. Rahul Duveni is a freshman actuarial science major who minors in business. Salman Dinesh is a junior communications and public relations major. And Yen Wen is a freshman nursing student. This is the Psycho Llamas. Yes, give them a round of applause again. We love applause. All right, stage two of our random trivia questions. We've got our candy deliverer ready. What U.S. city is the home to the Mile High Stadium? Correct right here. The city, though. He got it correct. It's Denver. The U.S. city that is home to the Mile High Stadium is Denver. Good job. Next, question, next trivia question. What was the original name of Fyodor Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment? Does anyone know what the original name of Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment was? It's kind of a hard one. Anyone want to take a stab at it? Dare to be wrong. You will get chocolate. Or nerds. We have Laffy Taffy. No? Well, that is a good try, but that is not the right answer. <laughs> the correct answer is the drunkards. The drunkards, plural. I haven't read Crime and Punishment, so I don't know how that applies, but if you have, I see a couple of giggles. Might not be related, but there you have it. What university presents the annual Pulitzer Prize Journalism Awards? Does anybody know? What university presents the annual Pulitzer Prize Journalism Awards? We've just got all the correct answers right here. You must want all the candy, right? You're correct. Columbia University. Have you ever applied for Jeopardy? <laughs> you should. Not that these are Jeopardy type questions, they're really not. But every once in a while there's an easy one on there. All right, last question for this segment. What brightly colored monkey is the world's largest? No, but good try. Anyone know what brightly colored monkey is the world's largest? No, but good try. You want some candy? Are you sure? We've got a whole basket. He said orangutan. You said that? That's not right either. Think large, the world's largest. Nope, not brightly colored. The What brightly colored monkey is the world's largest? That's not cheating. If you know it, answer. Don't. I, I, we want you to try and answer, or answer if you know. There's candy. No, we've scared her away. All right. The correct answer is the mandrill, which I had to look up. They're amazing looking. I don't know, but the orangutan is only one color, and the mandrel has like th four or five colors. It is beautiful. They're both beautiful. All God's creatures are beautiful. Oh, well, all right. Now we're getting, we're getting crazy over here. I won't repeat that. Okay, team three, the Beardy McBeardo faces working hard last week's winners. Cynthia Ochoa is a junior communications major who minors in broadcasting. Karam Khalil is a junior operations management major who minors in real estate. And Whitney Adindu is a freshman nursing major. The Beardy McBeardo faces, give them another round of applause, guys. Okay, last segment of random trivia. What is the only continent without any bees? 
Think about it. Bees. What is the only continent without any bees? Yes, ma'am. Correct answer over here, Antarctica. Yes, you get candy to go with your popcorn. It's like a trail mix, kind of. Awesome. That was the correct answer. What does the C in the equation E equals MC squared stand for? <sighs> you have to try to let other people answer. <laughs> Did anybody not hear that and want to want to guess the answer? <laughs> yes, indeed. It's the speed of light back there in the white t-shirt. All right, here's some Texas trivia. Dr. Pepper was first sold in 1885 in which Texas city? Oh, so many correct answers. Just like spring, yeah, we got one right here. Back here, black t-shirt. Don't you want some candy? Martin, just, just go and give everyone a little piece of candy. You know, it's finals. Finals of POW and almost finals of the spring semester. All right, last trivia question, guys. What was the last film of director Stanley Kubrick? You are correct. Eyes Wide Shut was Stanley Kubrick's last film. Right here. He doesn't want candy, though. Or maybe you do now. You feel good about that win? Uh, okay. <laughs> Eyes Wide Shut. Yeah, I think we have that in our catalog somewhere at the, I think, the Architecture and Fine Arts Library. Very good film. Very risque. Good thing we're all adults here. All right. That was the last trivia question. We're down to seven minutes and 44 seconds, guys. Woo, time flies when you're doing random trivia. I wrote that. I'm going to introduce our judges who uh, have just generously offered their time and expertise today. Here in the middle of our judging table, Loleen Martins Crane, right here in the center. Yeah, give her a little round of applause, a little raisin of the roof. That's right, she was doing the Cabbage Patch earlier. Loleen is the director for the UTA Career Development Center. She is an alumnus from UTA and received her master's in industrial organization psychology from UNT. She brings over 25 years of business experience in various industries to include government, international consulting, telecommunications, travel, medical, security and retail, and hopes to now bring industry perspective to her new role at UTA. Loleen is passionate about career development for all students and alumni. Yes, you are. Thank you so much for being here. Peter Crouch, who was here with us last week. Dean Crouch joined UTA. Where was his applause? I didn't, there wasn't, there we got a knee slap. Dr. Crouch is with us. He joined UTA in August 2016 as Dean of the College of Engineering and as a professor of electrical engineering. Dean Crouch has served a total of 21 years as Dean of Arizona State University's Ira A. Fulton School of Engineering and Dean of Engineering at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. A native of England, Crouch earned his undergraduate degree in engineering science from Warwick University in Coventry in 1973 and his master's degree in control theory from Warwick the following year. Crouch then earned his PhD in applied sciences from Harvard University in 1977. Get a load of him. Now you can give him another round of applause. Thank you, Dr. Crouch. And we have Robert Magnuson. Did I say it right? Mag did I? Did I, I? You're laughing. I must not have said it right. How do you say your last name? Magnuson. 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 All right. I think I got it. <laughs> Robert is the Texas Instruments Distinguished University Chair in Nanoelectronics and Professor of Electrical Engineering here at UTA. He directs the UT Arlington Nanophotonics Device Group. 
He is the co-founder and chief technical officer of Resonant Sensors Incorporated, a company that provides next-generation optical sensor systems for pharmaceutical and biotech customers. He's a fellow of the Optical Society of America, SPIE, IEEE, -E -E, and the National Academy of Inventors. Amazing. Give him a round of applause. Thank you so much for joining us. And for answering almost all of the trivia questions <laughs> correctly. <laughs> Oh, so the time has gone away, literally and figuratively. Four minutes and 24 seconds. Anyone watching in the audience have an idea of what they would do for this prompt? Anyone have any ideas what they would do with a prompt including engineering batteries and multiple plastics? No one want to take a stab at what they would do? Oh, okay. Shy audience again. It's all right. Do you have an idea? No. All right. That's okay. We don't have to. We don't have to have people, you know, giving their ideas, and including the invisible people here. You what? You got a patent your idea first, and nobody steals it. Right. That's smart. Smart. People like to steal things here. Uh, Sami, do you want to come and do a little startup lounge pitch? Asami Nagakora is the strategic initiatives coordinator for the startup lounge and part of the planning team for this here event. She's going to let us know what the startup lounge is all about and what they're currently doing. Asami. Hi, everyone. My name is Asami. Um, I'm a grad student here at UTA, uh, but I also work at place called Startup Lounge. It's a place for all kinds of entrepreneurs. Uh, you don't have to be a student here. And we have seminars and workshops. Um, seminars, it's at a building called Campus Center close to Mac. So if you go to the Mac and turn around and you'll see the sign. And um, we're having our workshop every Wednesday and so it's today at 5.30 p.m. And next week, we are going to have a networking party. So if you want to come in, um, please do so. And we are going to start having an um, intensive workshop in June for seven weeks. So we are um, having that registration started pretty soon. And what is the workshop today at 5.30 on? Today we are talking about crowdfunding, but it's uh, it's on um, video and image part of crowdfunding. Cool, thank you, Asami. Give Asami a round of applause. It's all about the applause. Applause. That's a Lady Gaga song. I forget how the chorus goes. You should look it up. But I'm not really aging myself with the Lady Gaga reference. I did earlier with Jolene. But I feel like everyone should know Jolene because it's Dolly Parton. It is. It's a classic. That's how I remembered how to say Lolene's name is Jolene. Jolene, 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 Jolene. One minute and 22 seconds, teams. Ooh, the time is ticking, ticking, ticking. You guys getting ready? One minute and 13 seconds. This is exciting. You can see what they're doing. I think everyone's using PowerPoint. Tidy, tidy. And we're down to the one minute countdown. Do you guys have your um, phones ready to do voting for the poll? Live voting, if you'd like. And viewers at home, you can vote as well. Pollev.com forward slash Martin Wallace, no E. 439 P O L L E V dot com forward slash M A R T I N W A L L A C 439. Once this timer is done and once our, our teams do their pitches, we will have the live results of the voting up on this screen. We're down to 15 seconds, teams. Put your finishing touches. On your pitches, I feel like there could be like a poem there. 
Finishing touches on the pitches. What, what's next? Who, anyone want to compose that with me? Time! Time's up, teams. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to see what you've come up with. All right, pencils, brains, all motion stopped. The time is up. You will each have five minutes to present your pitches. Now, you'll have five minutes. You, can, you, you don't have to use the whole five minutes, but you can use no longer than five minutes. And then judges, you'll have a moment for a clarification question per team. If you can limit it to one question per team, that would be great for the sake of time. And we will get started. Team one, are you guys ready? The Almost Invisible Cows. Meow. Oh, guys, also just a reminder to speak really closely to the mic. Uh-oh, we've lost connection. Technical difficulties. I haven't sung the Jeopardy theme song yet. Could do that. You know how it goes. Oh, we're back. Lovely. Okay, so you actually, I think you need to bring it back in live into the screen. While they're doing that, just a reminder to speak closely to the mic. If you hold it here, we're not going to pick you up. you got to be right up in here. Okay. Hello, everybody. Come when you're ready. Almost. So we're the uh, Almost Invisible Cows, and we want to bring an idea to you that really has no limits, that really doesn't have a cap on its, uh, on its possibilities. And what that is, let me ask you, raise your hand if you ever played with Legos as a kid. Raise your hand if you ever played with Play-Doh as a kid. So what we've done is we were thinking about it, and we decided, well, we're going to make something. We're going to put something together that lets people revive that sort of creative working with your hands. But we're going to take the caps off of what it is you have to work with, with Legos. Legos are great. What's the problem with Legos? Number one, you can step on them, and it hurts. Number two, Legos are hard, plastic, they're not, they're not adjustable. The best that you can do is put different Legos together in their already standard shapes and make what you can out of that. And it usually ends up with real hard, rigid surfaces. Play-Doh. What's great about Play-Doh? You mold it yourself. You can make anything that you want with it. You can use tools. You can use... Any, any item, rolling pins, you can use whatever you want to make it exactly like you think that it should be. So what we've done is we have given the best of those two worlds, and that is using remoldable plastics. What's great about remoldable plastics? Number one, moldable plastics combine those two things. They combine the best of Legos and they combine the best of Play-Doh by letting you mold it into whatever shape you want. But when it comes time to have your finished product, it doesn't fall apart or get dry and crack. So it has the structural soundness that comes with Legos with the ability to make it into anything that you want like Play-Doh does. So what we've done is we've taken this and we've put it into a kit sort of this, uh, uh, just like a box of Legos would come, just like an like a engineering kit, so to speak. And when you include wires, batteries, all these different things that are able to be used by kids. It's an engineering kit for, not necessarily for kids, but able to be used by kids. What we wanted to do was make it so that any age, anybody that has any sort of interest in testing out their engineering or creative abilities 
has the opportunity. You use batteries, you incorporate electricity, you can make anything from it. So I'll be talking about the uh, engineering kit preparation. And the goal here is to have a kit that comes in with simple, easy to use wires and batteries for kids. So these kids can go ahead and connect the wrong wire and it's not gonna short circuit on them or something's gonna go wrong. It's really foolproof and any kid or any age can use it. Even adults, as he said. Uh, real life applications, the goal here is to build sustainable robotics. And through that, Play-Doh doesn't harden as fast as you want. With remotable plastics, you're able to harden way faster than regular Play-Doh, and it's not a Lego too. So it's a hybrid between the two. And as he said, it's also structurally sound. Why do we care? So it's for the social good. Every, anyone can work with these uh, kits. And also, it's able to, uh, this kit was able to help the kids be more active with their hands, and also can teach them like, to be more creative and put out their ideas out there. And also, it's very simple and easy to use because, and safe to use, so anybody, Anybody can use this kit, and like anyone can learn in the kit. There can be like videos or and instructions on how to build these kits or how to build a product in these kits. And since like Legos are limited because they have a fixed shape or and size, while these removable removable plastics they are very flexible and easy to use, and they're very uh, you can do anything with them. And you never have to Hello. And you never have to worry about messing up because you can always start over. Reheat your plastic, mold it back in its original form, and start making whatever it is you want all over again. Five minutes exactly. Great job, the almost invisible cows. Judges, do you have a clarification question for them? How, how does the plastic that you intend to use differ from uh, Play-Doh? The way the plastic differs from Play-Doh is that when moldable plastic hardens, it maintains its shape. It doesn't crack and become brittle. It actually is able to support weight. It has that structural soundness that I was talking about with Legos. You warm it back up underwater, hot water. All right. And it's called the Innovation Station. The Innovation Station. Thank you, the Almost Invisible Cows. Yes. Team two, you guys ready? All right, the Psycho Llamas. You got five minutes. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, so, uh, we are presenting uh, using battery-operated uh, moldable plastic, uh, you know, in military aspect. So, how are we going to use it? Next. So, uh, there, uh, here are two vehicles, right? Now, the uh, one in snow has a different kind of wheel, uh, tire needed for, uh, to, uh, for it to operate. And the one in the sand, it needs different kind of tire. Now, for uh, different, uh, you know, terrain, they use different tires, and it's really, really costly. The budget is uh, in more than, uh, the budget is in billion of dollars. So what we are doing is, we are uh, using moldable plastic to make self-morphing tires and external morphing shell of vehicles. So how will it work? Let's say you are in snow, and you are going to go to a different terrain. Uh, the plastic, it'll, uh, the plastic tires, they will uh, morph themselves, or they will remold themselves to uh, be workable in a different terrain. Now, how will they get molded, you know? So they need some kind of power. So the batteries, they, uh, they will be battery operated. The batteries will give them the power to remold themselves. And uh, that's, that's how it can be used in any other different terrain. Also, uh, the, plastic, uh, the plastic batteries, they can be controlled from a tablet-sized device. So let's say you, you are going to switch from a snow terrain to a different kind of terrain. Now, that uh, you press a button on a tablet, and the you know the tire is changed and that's how it will work in different terrains also uh, we are going to use the pl moldable plastic in spinach now how it will work is like let's say the sp uh, spies use different kind of camouflages for their different equipments and gadgets now they uh, they all they need is one moldable plastic uh, material and they can mold it uh, to conceal any equipment 
The um, one, uh, one addition to the moldable plastic to make it a little more applicable, um, there's a uh, interior lining on the plastic that streamed through the, or sorry, the moldable plastic has an interior lining um, allowing the plastic to be morphed through the internal small batteries in the subject. There would be a small casing of essentially a black box in the center of the moldable plastic in a carbon fiber casing, allowing it to be strand uh, and controlled from a small tablet, as he said, from your wrist, um, allowing it to be morphed from any sort of range, from being within the vehicle uh, or hundreds of miles away. Did you want to add more? Judges, do you have a clarification question for the cycle llamas? What are the biggest barriers to this production? What are the biggest barriers to this production? Okay, so uh, right now, what they use is rubber, right? They use rubber tires. Now, they are not feasible. Now, uh, you cannot use them in different terrains. You cannot use the same tire in a, uh, the terrain. So now, right now, uh, the moldable plastic, the technology is much more efficient. Instead of that rubber, you can use the moldable plastic, and you can use it in different terrains. Then they need no, uh, you know, let's say another company or someone making it making different tire for different terrains for you. You can yourself do it, you know, by using a switch or something uh, in a tablet and uh, on your own. Great job, guys! The cycle llamas. Yes. All right, team three. Are you guys ready? The beardy McBeardo faces. You have five minutes. Remember to speak closely to the mic. Gotcha, gotcha. Not too much, we can't waste time. Have you ever wanted to bring your cell phone to life? Have you ever wished that your cell phone can actually appear in thin air virtually to whatever it is that you are doing? Well, I'm here to make wishes come true. Hollow Me, a device that connects directly to your cell phone via Bluetooth capabilities. From a raise of hands, how many of you have family that's overseas, maybe Chicago, maybe Cali? Mexico, we got some in Mexico. We got a whole lot of people. Now picture this. Imagine you're FaceTiming your mom. You're talking to your dad, your brother, your sister, and they're across the world. Imagine you put a rumbus on top of your cell phone, and you see your mom in the kitchen walking back and forth in thin air in real time, and it appears real. Well, like I said, I'm here to make wishes come true. So we are currently working on the, on the engineering side with optical engineers, and also we have tested the use of TNZ and Bluetooth capabilities and Raspberry Pi. What these are are softwares to make this dream come a reality. And here is what we will be doing with the battery. So of course everything requires a battery. So we decided to use a lithium ion battery, which is powerful and strong to be able to hold up this capable device that we're creating. The molding that we're gonna be using is what? It's going to be a rhombus. Why is it gonna be a rhombus? It's gonna be a rhombus so that every, like as it's on the screen, it will be reflecting off each side of the screen. So this hologram will look very realistic. Exactly, so what we're gonna be using is the rhombus just like she said. It's gonna be left, right, straight, up. It's gonna be four angles, reflect the image and it's gonna bring that image into reality. The business model is very simple. The cost to make moldable plastics Polythene is very easy, it's heatable, and that's how we're going to design it. The cost for an iPhone screen is $3, and the cost for an iPad, and as the screens get bigger, of course, will become higher. So for the iPad, we have $5. Now, people say that the future is near. We say the future is here. Hollow me. Thank you. Great job, guys. Judges, do you have any clarification questions? Uh, is this more like uh, holography or more like tricks with mirrors like they do in Disney World? 
So you could say it's a mix of two because we're not only trying to create the pictures in your phone to just come out of the phone itself, but it's going to be reflecting off of the rhombus as well, but it's going to appear in virtual reality, so it's going to be in thin air. So you're going to be able to see, like I said, the people who are on FaceTime and so forth walk in front of you, talk in front of you. So it's going to be a reflection of how you said the Disney stuff, stuff is, but also it's a mix of both virtual reality and that. Yeah. Thank you. Great job, Beardy McBeardo faces. Yay, teams. All right, judges, you have about five minutes to judge, figure out who you think the winning team is. Now our voting will go live. Martin, do you want to put the, um, the live poll up after delivering candy? If you want to vote, remember, pollev.com forward slash M-A-R-T-I-N-W-A-L-L-A-C 439. Once Martin's done giving candy, he'll put up the live feed for the voting. Mm -hmm. P-O-L-L-E-V dot com forward slash M-A-R-T-I-N-W-A-L-L-A-C 439. Now the judges will declare who wins. If there happens to be a tie amongst the judges, then the audience vote will declare the winner. We will also freeze the live voting results when the judges have declared that they have selected a winner. There was a slight discrepancy a couple of weeks ago, and that's how we made that rule up. All right, live polls going, fluctuating. All right, interesting. Get your votes in. You guys voting too? Good job. Rock the vote. This is actually the closest live feed wise that it's been this whole month. Well, the, I'm saying between the, the, all three teams, there was, this is um, fluctuating across the board as opposed to between two teams. Everybody get their votes in. Oh. Judges just give me a little little wink or a, a little shimmy when you've got the winning team decided. Looks like our live voting is still fluctuating. That's jazz. Bow, bow. That's some jazz stylings to the tune of Jeopardy. You're welcome. It's <laughs> exciting. This is actually the the longest the judges have taken in our whole month of doing these. I think the poll is full. The poll caps at 40 votes. So the audience has declared a clear winner. Now we just need to hear from the judges. Do we have a clear winner, judges? Will you point? Okay. Okay, so our poll is frozen. The judges have a clear winner. There is no tie, so that means that the judges' winner is the winner. And the winner of our very first UTA Pitch of the Week 
event and winning a $50, $50 gift certificate each is Team 3, the Beardy McBeardo Faces. Congratulations! Yay! Everyone, congratulations for participating and making it this far and providing... Oh, and yeah, our, our audience vote was um, a clear winner of Team 1, the Almost Invisible Cows, so bragging rights there. And everyone did an awesome job. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating. Oh, yeah, judges, judges. Sorry, thank you, Martin. Would you like to give feedback to the teams before we depart? Sure. Uh, I, what what uh, won me over for Team 3 was the smooth presentation of the lead speaker and then followed up with uh, snappy connections with the, with the team members. Also, they have uh, sort of an interesting idea that uh, was uh, far out, sort of. Um, and um, so I thought the creativity was really good, so you did very well. The other teams uh, also I thought did very well. Um, I, th I, think, um, I think team uh, one need needed a bit, bit of a lubrication. You were a little bit stiff, uh, hesitant in the presentation. Uh, uh, you could improve on that and the handoffs. And the team three made the mistake of not including one member. Right. And everybody would just, you know, you, you should come up here and hop around and be visible and dynamic and vigorous. Show some spunk, right? <laughs> and that, that, that's why I, uh, you lost some points for me for that. Let me just to build on uh, for team three, I think one of the things was the emotional connection when you asked the question around the mother or there was a, a parent or something, you know, making an emotional connection early on. And then you talked about costs. So that was a, a potentially something that we looked at as well. or I, I was looking at as well. Um, and uh, yeah, using all of the team members in the presentation, I think helped a lot as well. So team one had a really good um, all the questions that you were asking in the beginning with the Legos and with the Play-Doh, so that was a really good hook too, and Team 3 also did a hook you know, for me to engage. So. I just want to say that um, it was very close. In fact, uh, there was not unanimity amongst the judges in the orders, but what, what uh, the deciding uh, criterion was the aggregate points that was won. So uh, it, it's not just uh, the order in ranking of your presentations. It's how well you actually did on an absolute value, which is why Team 3 won. I say for doing this and being here and performing uh, along the way some entrepreneurship makes all three teams winners. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much, judges. Thank you, teams. Thank you, audience. Join us when we do this again next semester or whenever it happens. <laughs> Bye.